This dude, I just love this photograph, this picture rather. We'll come back to them in a minute. Anyway, so we'll begin now. Just a, a brief recap of um, introduction to the Western tradition so far. Um, hopefully you've got the glossary and the handouts. If you don't, there's some more down here. Um, on Tuesday, we looked at the Western tradition and why we should care about it, because it obviously informs our worldview now. It's still very much part of the atmosphere we breathe in the West, and the West now dominates culturally the world in many ways. So we looked at Hellenism, Plato and Aristotle and a few aspects of Judaism. And then on Thursday, we looked more in more detail at the Jewish Bible, Jesus, the historical Jesus, as opposed to the Jesus of the Christian faith, the four gospels and the early church up to the Emperor Constantine. And then yesterday we looked at the Renaissance um, and the Reformation. And we looked at a guy called Erasmus and uh, his discovery that the Trinity verse is not actually in the Bible. It was added much later, probably in the 8th century. And we looked briefly at Martin Luther and Calvin, who started the Reformation, particularly Luther, who gave us, in, in, a, in a way, the idea of the modern individual, the individual unmediated before God, who um, is accountable not to the church or priests, but directly to his own conscience before God. And this idea of the individual, individualism is obviously a hallmark of our age. And today we're going to be looking at um, what's known as the Enlightenment, or the Age of Reason. Um, and on the handout, if you want to have a look uh, at, I'll read it out anyway, I've got a definition on the, under the glossary of what the Enlightenment is. Uh, everything I'm going to say today, I'm just skirting the surface. We can go into much greater depth, so I'm keenly aware of how superficial what, what I'm saying is in a way. So the Enlightenment, what is it? Well, it's an intellectual and philosophical movement that dominated Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. It encouraged skepticism towards traditional religion and the idea and, and encouraged ideas, encouraged respect rather for reason, reason, thinking, logical, critical thinking as the guiding principle of human affairs. And it promoted ideals such as liberty, progress, toleration, fraternity, constitutional government, and the separation of the church and state. And also there's an emphasis on the scientific method and reductionism as well. We'll come to this. This has had a huge global influence. Many of these ideas, by the way, had, had their, um, uh, were found in an earlier Islamic Enlightenment tradition, but we're not going to go into that today. So they weren't entirely new ideas. That They did have Islamic anti antecedents in, in many ways. So um, we come to our, our friend, Sir Isaac Newton. I've already mentioned that he uh, was a, a mathematician, physicist, astronomer. He was a theologian in private. Uh, he was at Cambridge University, where he was professor there. He was actually from Cambridge, and he was an MP there. And he's recognized as one of the greatest mathematicians and physicists of all time, uh, and one of the greatest and most influential scientists. And he was a key figure in the philosophical revolution known as the Enlightenment. Um, one of his most famous books is called the Principia Mathematica, Principia Mathematica in English, the mathematical principles of natural uh, philosophy. Natural philosophy was the term at that time for what we call science. And this was published in uh, 1687. And in this, very briefly, he established what was called classical mechanics, uh, that the idea um, that, uh, well, we'll come to that in a second. So classical mechanics is the key word uh, concept there. He also made huge contributions to optics and shares credit with that German mathematician called Gottfried Leibniz for developing what's called infinitesimal calculus. And we're not gonna go into that today. Um, so he's famous for formulating the laws of motion and universal gravitation that form the dominant scientific viewpoint until pretty much it was superseded by Einstein by his theory of general relativity in the beginning of the 20th century. So <clears throat> one of the, for me, one of the distinctive characteristics of his mechanistic worldview is the idea of a universe as a clockwork machine where all the parts worked perfectly uh, together, created by God for sure, a kind of deism. Um, and th this is a, a worldview that doesn't really require God. 
it kind of excludes any supernatural interventions by the deity. So it's kind of self-sufficient. Um, and I just want to, by way of contrast, um, share some words from one of my favorite books called The Quran and the Secular Mind, a philosophy of Islam by Shabir Akhtar, who's a teacher at Oxford. And he contrasts this mechanistic worldview um, with the Quranic or the Islamic worldview. And he, he makes some very interesting and insightful observations. And I'd just like to, to read to you a few words from what he said. It's quite densely packed, this, so I'll try and read it more slowly, just so we can take in what he's saying. This is page 169. The Quranic, like the biblical worldview, conflicts, he says, with the scientific perspective, which assumes that the cosmos is a self-contained set of patterned empirical sequences. Intelligible, intelligible to us in terms of natural causality. So to us, we understand the universe as, as, a, as a, a nexus of cause and effect. The spatial temporal continuum is subject to discoverable lawful regularity. So we don't need any revelation to understand the universe. We can examine it, examine the laws of nature, he says. Recently, he is referring to the new physics, quantum mechanics, probability laws couched in statistical terms replace the older laws of causality as physical indeterminacy complicated the picture at the subatomic level. So he's alluding there to we've now gone beyond Einstein, uh, sorry, Newton's understanding of simple causality, cause and effect, to statistical, <coughs> statistical probability at the quantum level, I think. He goes on, a metaphysic of events, a metaphysic of events now supplants the older metaphysic of natural objects or substances uncomplicatedly locatable in three-dimensional space. But nature, and this is a crucial point, remains autonomous and self-sustaining. For Newton, for Einstein, the universe was self-contained and autonomous. Islam, he says, posits an additional supernatural realm and denies the autonomy of nature. And he references Quran 3541. Directly, actively, and continuously, God sustains the world after creating it. He prevents the lowest heaven, our sky, from collapsing on sinful humanity, 2265. Arranges the clouds, directs the winds that give rain and revive the dead earth, holds the birds poised in midair, and keeps the two seas separate. Quranic cosmology, and again this is in contrast with the Enlightenment view, presupposes continuous interaction between the natural causal world and the supernatural realm of occult causality. This idea of the hidden action of God that we can't actually see, but we can see the effects of it in the universe. Supernatural agents routinely act within and interpenetrate the world of empirical causality. The jinn, elemental spirits found in the intricate nexus of Arabic poetry, possession and madness are integral to the pre-Islamic outlook and remain part of modern Islam. Indeed, Iblis, the, the devil, is a jinn created from fire. His arrogant free will led him to freely reject God's rule. He is an actively malicious agent in human history. This is the whole Islamic world, a uh, view of total reality, rather than just the narrow, mechanistic, scientific, self-contained worldview. So he's really laboring the point here. Uh, Iblis is actively malicious agent in human history. God, too, is active. He shapes the embryo in the womb as he pleases and removes the souls of sleepers at night so that each day is a fresh resurrection as the souls of those destined to live are returned to life until an appointed hour. In the spiritual interaction between the two worlds, human petition, prayer, piety, pure speech, and good deeds ascend to the unseen world. And then this, the uh, Akhtar, this is crushing conclusion. This picture is incompatible with empirical science. 
modern scientists feel obliged to reject on principle the possible existence of God, the devil, indeed all spirits, including those of the departed dead, the jinn, demons, angels, and other immaterial or incorporeal entities lacking space-time coordinates. I'll leave it there. So he's obviously, um, the, the answer would be that the modern scientific project has its role perhaps within its own sphere, but the Islamic perspective is total, it's holistic, it includes all the multi-dimensional realities that uh, make up existence, reality, including God uh, and these other dimensions. So it's an extraordinary contrast, I think, with a very limited and narrow perspective of Newton, however valid in its own terms it is, with a much broader, inclusive um, Islamic and monotheistic perspective. So our next um, dude is this guy. Um, anyone know who he is? What does it say? Oh, just about, yes. Kant. <laughs> okay. Do you know, I like this picture because you get, the, you get the sense of the spotlight being on his brain. You know, this is one of the most brilliant men in human history. Um, uh, Kant uh, was born in 1724. He was a German philosopher and one of the, the most important thinkers of the Enlightenment. In fact, I think he's probably the greatest philosopher uh, after Plato. I think he's an extraordinary thinker. Um, his incredible systematic comprehensive works discuss epistemology, metaphysics, ethics, and aesthetics. And as I say, one of the most influential figures in modern uh, Western philosophy. Now, he argued that humans possess moral autonomy from God, and any external source, be it God or scripture or church, um, is to be rejected. Okay. And he developed his ethics or moral philosophy in a, a very famous book called The Groundwork of the Metaphysic of Morals, which is a great book, I, I recommend it. And in this work, he tries to convert our everyday obvious rational knowledge of morality, of right and wrong, into a philosophical knowledge, a philosophical system. And he's known for his theory that there is a single moral obligation, which he called the categorical imperative. This expression, the categorical imperative, is key to his um, ethical um, worldview. And this is kind of derived from his concept of duty. He was actually kind of Prussian, so he was a good German guy. He believed in duty. Um, now, categorical imperatives are principles that are intrinsically valid. They don't require God to validate them or give us any guidance, they're intrinsically valid. They are good in and of themselves, and they must be obeyed in all situations and circumstances if our behavior is to be moral, if it's to obey the moral law. So the categorical imperative provides a test against which moral statements can be assessed. So examples of categorical imperatives as absolute commands are do A or you ought to do B. Uh, like, you, sh you shouldn't kill, would be one example, or you ought to help those in need, or don't steal. It doesn't matter what your wants or goals in life are, what your desires are, you should follow the categorical imperative no matter what. Uh, so it's quite a strict, austere German uh, idea, and doesn't really admit of many exceptions. Um, unlike the Sharia, of course, where there are rules, but they can have exceptions to them in practice, uh, in exceptional circumstances, of course. So um, I'm just going to touch on some of these figures very briefly. Um, if you want to look into uh, in more detail, I do encourage you to do that, because these are extremely influential figures today. My own favorite work by him is called The, uh, the Critic of Pure Reason, uh, which is about epistemology. Uh, which we're not going to go into, um, but that, it, for me, like, was like climbing up Mount Everest. It was the most extraordinary experience. Um, I've never read anything quite like it in philosophy. Moving on to this country, France, and the French Revolution. So this, um, if you can read French, um, is basically advertising the slogan of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. <laughs> Okay, so the French Revolution happened in 1789. 
um, and they overthrew the, the old order, the Ancien Regime uh, under Louis XVI, uh, which was heavily dominated by the Catholic Church. Cardinals ruled very much, ruled France. One particular cardinal did anyway. So all that was, the old order was overthrown and a new regime came in in the name of, and liberty, egality, fraternity is still the slogan in France. If you go there, you'll see that in, outside town halls. It's just still the official line. It was the, the slogan of the French um, Republic. Um, and, and this really promoted ideals of, uh, the ideal of secular idealism, the idea that uh, we're no longer uh, following God, that we follow human progress, we follow the ideals of the Enlightenment. But it came at a price, um, and that is the reign of terror, which happened pretty much soon after 1789. Um, it was an attempt to eradicate so-called counter-revolutionaries, those who didn't agree with this, uh, particularly traditionalists or Catholics or royalists. And by the time the reign of terror was over in 1794, about 17,000 people had been guillotined, um, which was the, the guillotine was supposed to be a humane way of doing it, by the way, because before people were executed in rather brutal ways, the, Mr. Guillotine, actually a, a name of a guy, he invented this machine, it was supposed to be a more humane way of dispatching people. <laughs> um, whether it is humane, I don't know, but anyway, so. Um, we're not going to go into the French Revolution in any detail here, but th this was so influential, it influenced movements across the world. Secularism came, came very much uh, at the heart of the French Republic. It still is today a very militant form of secularism that pushes religion into the private realm. First the Catholic Church and the Jews as well, and now of course Muslims in France um, find it very difficult often to express their faith in a public way um, because it's seen as contrary to the uh, laicite, the, uh, the ideas of the French Republic. So th this um, movement, began, beginning in France, still is impactful on the world today. And because of French colonialism, of course, we saw the spread of these ideals in uh, Algeria and other parts of the world, which did affect Muslims directly um, until uh, independence. So moving on quickly. Can anyone, anyone know who this dude is? Sorry, they're all English, these guys. I'm sorry about that. But this guy is uh, Charles Darwin, uh, an English uh, naturalist. So he was born in 1809. Um, was extremely famous naturalist, geologist, biologist, best known for his contributions to evolutionary biology. And he proposed the idea that all the species of life descended from a common ancestor. And this is now widely accepted and considered a fundamental concept in science. Um, and he introduced his scientific theory that this branching pattern of evolution, this tree of life that he called, resulted from a process that he called natural selection, in which the struggle for existence in the animal world has a similar effect to the artificial selection involved in selective breeding. Now, he's been called one of the most influential figures in human history, along with Newton. Um, he's even buried in Westminster Abbey. And his most famous work, of course, on his theory of evolution is called On the Origin of Species, published in 1859. Now, Darwin is very controversial, particularly um, uh, amongst Muslims and Christians. Uh, and we're not going to go into the rightness and wrongness of anything he said, but I do encourage you to watch uh, a video called Islam and Evolution with Professor Shoaib uh, on blogging theology where uh, he, he's a, a scientist himself and a theologian, Professor Shoaib, um, and he discusses the implications of Darwinism for uh, Muslims and Islam, what can and cannot be accepted from him. Um, and he also talks about intelligent design as well, which is also very fashionable these days. Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. A, a lot of good stuff has now been written. Uh, Hamza Zorsa has written about this, as you say. Uh, but uh, uh, as a first port of call uh, of a scientist talking about it from a Muslim point of view, Professor Shoaib, I recommend his his talk on blogging theology. 
Um, <clears throat> now, who is this dude with a very fine beard? Gone back to Germany again. Keep on switching between. Um, so this is Karl Marx, of course, born in 1818. So I'm giving you some just key figures in the Enlightenment world uh, without going into any depth because we just don't have the time. Um, but these, I these figures, these ideas that they brought to the world are hugely influential today. Karl Marx, uh, obviously, um, well, he went to England. He ended up in England, <laughs> actually, um, where he wrote Das Kapital, uh, Capital, in the British Library in London. Um, and for, I think for our purposes, one of the most important things he formulated was something called historical materialism. This um, idea uh, that human societies, including, including their religions and laws and morality, are in some way the outgrowth of collective economic activity. Um, and central to that was, of course, the class struggle. Class struggles as this dynamism in history that's moving ultimately towards socialism and communism. Um, so he was an atheist. Um, and atheism is central to his worldview. He saw the fundamental uh, constituents of reality are the forces of production, the modes of production, economic activity. And he had no time for religion. He thought religion was the sigh of an oppressed creature. And religion would kind of disappear as um, the advanced socialist world came into being. We wouldn't need religion anymore, he thought. Um, so obviously his ideas are kind of, they come and come and go in popularity. I think they're back into fashion now in, in many uh, particularly in America of all places, amongst some young people and students. Who's this guy? We're still in Germany, by the way. This is uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, born in 1844. Um, a very brilliant um, man. He was a, an academic, a philologist. Uh, he, uh, but for our purposes, I want to quote to use some of the words of his from a very famous book he wrote called Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Thus Spoke Zarathustra. This is um, a brilliant book. And it goes like this in the book. God is dead. God remains dead. And we have killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all murderers? What was holiest and mightiest of all that the world has yet owned has bled to death under our knives. Who will wipe this blood off us? What water is there for us to clean ourselves? What festivals of atonement, what sacred games shall we have to invent? Is not the greatness of this deed too great for us? Must we ourselves not become gods simply to appear worthy of it? So this is Zarathustra in Thus Spoke Zarathustra, proclaiming to the world that God is dead. Now, he didn't believe that God had literally died, of course. He was proclaiming, in a sense, the, that because of developments in Western thought, the Enlightenment and so on, it was no longer possible to believe in God, he thought. And my answer to that is, God is dead, Nietzsche, 1883. Nietzsche is dead. God, 1900. <laughs> Nietzsche still matters. He's very fashionable. He's very fashionable on the left. He's very fashionable on the right. Hitler loved him. Uh, Nietzsche's uh, sister, uh, who outlived Nietzsche, uh, who died in 1900, presented Hitler with uh, collective works of his brother, her brother. And uh, the National Socialists read, uh, used to love Nietzsche. Whether or not they understood him correctly is another subject. But he's also very popular on the left. <laughs> Um, for, for very, very different reasons, as a kind of an existentialist, nihilist. Um, but I'm, again, I'm just mentioning him because he's such an influential figure today. So I, I kind of, that's my riposte to that, because God, Nietzsche, uh, God had the last uh, word, of course. Briefly, we're going to um, look at uh, the influence of colonialism um, and the, the sad humiliation of the Muslim world. Napoleon invaded Egypt in 1798. Napoleon, again, a very Enlightenment figure. He championed Enlightenment ideals. Um, and he brought an army of scholars into Egypt um, and to, to study the ancient culture. And he founded, this founded Egyptology. Um, Edward Said, the great um, Columbia professor, 
has written very, very, very well about this in his book, Orientalism, which I highly recommend, just written, I don't know, 20, 30 years ago, but it's still required reading on university courses, and he goes into the West's uh, perception of the Muslim world. The French also occupied Algeria, um, as, as you can uh, see there, and um, these are obviously some women in, in niqab, and the, the, the encouraging him, you know, aren't you, aren't you pretty? You know, unveil yourself. This is French government propaganda in Algeria, which then became part of France itself. It was no longer a separate country. So it's telling the, the women to um, unveil themselves um, in Algeria. This, this is quite interesting. In uh, 1966, uh, Time magazine, this very famous American publication, published this cover uh, in bright red and black. There's an iconic cover of this in, in the history of publishing. Is God dead? And why, why are they asking that? Well, because at that time, there were some Christian theologians who were saying God is dead, actually, um, and proclaiming this as some kind of modern secular reality that we ought to, Christianity ought, needs to go into this and accept that God is now dead. Um, and that this caused quite a lot of scandal and a lot of backlash from many Christians in America uh, who thought it was um, a ridiculous headline. Um, but I just wanted to, to share that with you as an iconic moment. And um, this is one of a couple of cartoons. Uh, <laughs> um, now, nah, religion, they're man-made institutions just to control us. We had this dude who is, um, well, you can see, uh, he's controlled by many other things, uh, including pills and McDonald's and other things, and not looking very healthy either um, when it comes to it. Um, I, I, for me, I, I think one of the key moments of uh, the triumph of secularism and liberal democracy was uh, the, uh, after the Second World War, when the Axis powers were defeated, uh, America stood alone globally as the dominant economic, political, cultural power in the world, free to export and impose its will, uh, which indeed it did. Um, and that's the world uh, we're living in now, of course. It's one of, one of my favorite um, memes. A bunch of atheists going from door to door, uh, showing them their pamphlets. And the guy's complaining, this pamphlet is blank because atheism has nothing to offer. <laughs> so, um, I quite like this one. My, Michael Nowak is professor of mathematics and biology at Harvard, one of the most distinguished biologists in the world. And um, this is uh, one of his statements. God is both creator and sustainer of the universe. And he says, the entire trajectory is known to God, who exists outside of time, eternal and atemporal, all-knowing, and all loving. I mean, that could come from the Quran. I mean, it's, it's incredible, that sentiment. But it is, he's a Christian. Um, and uh, it shows that um, an intelligent understanding of faith and God in the universe is still very much alive at the highest levels of um, academia. In so I just um, wanted to share with you some final thoughts from two works. Um, and I, I'm very conscious I've only skirted the surface here, so I apologize for that. I just simply don't have the time. But I do encourage you to look deeper into some of these thinkers to get a sense of the seminal influence they have had and do have on our world today. But what are the consequences of Enlightenment thought on, on the, the morale of Europeans and Americans? Are, they, are we now happy, and content, fulfilled? Do we now have meaning in our lives? Now we've dethroned God. Now we've declared God is dead. How are we spiritually in Europe and in the West? And to take that temperature, there's a, uh, the temperature of our, our souls. I want to refer to a book published a couple of years ago by Douglas Murray. He's uh, actually quite a well-known English journalist, writer. He often appears on the media. Um, two things you need to know about him which are relevant. One, he's an atheist. And secondly, well, secondly, he's quite right-wing. And thirdly, that he's gay. This is the language we, we use, and that's the language he uses. So he's written this book called The Strange Death of Europe, Migration, Identity, Islam. He doesn't like Islam very much. 
Um, and the dust cover says in brief, the strange death of Europe is a highly personal account of a continent and culture caught in the act of suicide, he says. It's a hugely influential book. And it's actually very well written. He talks about declining birth rates, mass immigration, you know, subtext, Muslims, and cultivated self-distrust and self-hatred. They have come together to make Europeans unable to argue for themselves and incapable of resisting their own comprehensive change in, uh, as a society. So I just want to read you uh, towards the end of the book where he talks about how, what it's like to be European now and what the issues are and why there's a problem. And I think it's, it's quite insightful. And then finally, I want to read from a book by uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, Tim Windsor, who addresses the same problem from a Muslim point of view. And I think it's much more interesting. So anyway, Douglas Murray says this on page 258. The problem is one that it is easier to feel than it is to prove, but it runs something like this that life in modern liberal democracies is to some extent thin or shallow, and that life in modern Western Europe in particular has lost its sense of purpose. So he's taking the temperature of what it is to be alive now in the West, Western Europe. Now, this is not to say, he says, that our lives are wholly meaningless, nor that the opportunity liberal democracy uniquely gives to pursue our own conception of happiness is misguided. On a day-to-day -day basis, most people find deep meaning and love from their families, friends, and much else. But there are questions that remain, which have always been central to each of us, and which liberal democracy on its own cannot answer, and was never meant to answer. What am I doing here? What is my life for? Does it have any purpose beyond itself? These are questions that have always driven human beings, questions that we have always asked and ask still. Yet for Western Europeans, the answers to these questions that we have held on to for centuries seem to have run out. Happy as we are to acknowledge that, we are far less happy to acknowledge that with our story of ourselves having run out, we are nonetheless still left with the same questions. And this is something very interesting. Even to ask such questions today has become something like bad manners. I didn't really realize this. It's kind of bad manners. It's kind of socially awkward. You know, what am I doing here? What's my life for? Does it have any purpose beyond itself? These are the questions that he asks. Bad manners. And the spaces where such questions can be asked, let alone answered, have accordingly shrunk, not only in number, but in their ambition for answers. In other words, you don't really look very much higher than perhaps very small little answers. If people no longer seek for answers in churches, which they don't, by the way, we simply hope that they might find sufficient meaning in the occasional visit to an art gallery or at a book club. And these are often seen as ways of getting meaning. If I go and see some great art in the National Gallery, maybe that'll help. He goes on, the German philosopher Jürgen Habermas addressed an aspect of this in 2007 when he led a discussion at the Jesuit School of Philosophy in Munich titled, An Awareness of What is Missing. An Awareness of What is Missing. There he attempted to identify a gap at the center of our post-secular age. He related how, in 1991, he had attended a memorial service for a friend at a church in Zurich. The friend had left instructions for the event that were closely followed. The coffin was present, and there were speeches by two friends. But there was no priest and no blessing. The ashes were to be strewn somewhere, and there was to be no amen. The friend, who had been an agnostic, had both rejected the religious tradition and was also publicly demonstrating that the non-religious view had failed. As Habermas interpreted his friend, quote, the enlightened modern age, 
this is the post-enlightenment age, has failed to find a suitable replacement for a religious way of coping with the funeral rite de passage which brings life to a close, end quote. And then Murray continues, the challenge that Habermas's friend posed can be quietly heard around us in contemporary Europe and the results of the questions go unanswered. The results of the question. So there are no answers. There are no answers, according to this profoundly pessimistic assessment of life in the West. We ask the questions, we look in art galleries, book clubs, but the questions go unanswered. But what about Muslims in Europe? Um, I come to this final book. Uh, Abdul Hakim Murad, also known as uh, Tim Winter, he's a professor at Cambridge, he's a Muslim convert. Um, it's called Travelling Home, Essays on Islam and Europe, and I do recommend this if you want to read more. He's very eloquent, not always easy to understand, but always insightful. And just the first page is worth uh, quoting, I think. And it's a little difficult to understand in parts. But, uh, um, so he begins by quoting um, a Jewish writer, Emmanuel Levinas, who said, Islam understood better than anyone that a universal truth is worth more than local particularisms, wrote Emmanuel Levinas. And Tim says, and this is obvious in this most post-axial and unparochial of monotheisms. But paradoxically, it is for this same reason that Muslims find themselves at home everywhere. For this same universalism of Islam enables a local rooting which recognizes that, quote, wheresoever you may turn, there is God's face. It's a quote from the Quran, chapter 3, 115. Wheresoever you turn, there is God's face. Following its Abrahamic nature and Mohammedan example, Islam has shown itself as an intrinsically portable religion with a strong historic culture of migration, hijra, and of migrants, muhajrun. The man of praise, he means Muhammad, upon whom be peace, like Abraham, was himself a refugee and an asylum seeker arriving destitute in his new shelter. The Hydra bisected and defined his entire prophetic career. Yet he came to conceive a love for Medina as well as for his native city. And this Dar al Hydra turned into his permanent and authentic home. So he's seeing the prophet here as a type, as a paradigm. In this combination, we find a paradigm which characteristically shapes Muslim identity. To Mecca, we turn in prayer and pilgrimage. But we fully belong in all places since, quote, the whole earth is made a mosque for me. And the healing signs of God's presence are everywhere. Even as for Quilliam, this is an English Muslim writer, out on the windswept Isle of Man, the Isle of Man is an island off England, geographically so remote from the Dar al-Islam. Such is this Muslim sense of belonging that believers feel more at home in a place than any atheist could, since to lose contact with God is immediately to forfeit one's sense of connection to a place of his making. It is to feel one's roots and identity shrivel. There can be no truly English, German, or Russian atheist. From this kind of Muslim perspective, Lenin was not Russian, Douglas Murray is not British, and Sam Harris is not American. They seem to wait in a forlorn foreign encampment, even when officially at home. By contrast, to become Muslim or to arrive from an Islamically Abrahamic place and to maintain that traditional sensibility which perceives God's signs superabundantly everywhere 
is immediately to see the land with understanding and hence to begin to grow roots and to adorn and engage the earth. Such, very roughly, is the Islamic theory of Abrahamic mobility. Unlike Israel's wandering in exile, which await the Messianic intervention which will take the people to a home greater than all homes, Muslims travel from one home to an equal other and do not cherish a return to the mother of cities except as visitors. They migrate Abrahamically, but every country for them is a promised land. So that's just page one of the book. Contrast that with Douglas Murray's bleak, atheist, empty experience of modernity. Uh, and contrast that with uh, Tim Winter, who's from Cambridge, just as English as Douglas Murray. Very different, enduring, profound, spiritual message. And it's the answer to Douglas Murray's emptiness. It is the very answer itself. So this is Islam's role in Europe, I think, is to offer that sense of being at home, even in Europe, with uh, awareness of God's signs, his ayat, all around us. And only then can we really feel we have meaning. And it's the answer to the suicide of Europe, as, as uh, Douglas Murray uh, calls it. Sorry, does anyone have any points they want to make before I conclude? Yes. Going back to the, uh, the Algerian propaganda post that was permission, yep. what would be the, the political movement behind the unveiling of the Muslim? And obviously, as Muslims, we have an understanding that this is a metaphysical assault, but politically, what is the, the, the motive of the French colonialists? Yeah, a, a very good question. There's a certain understanding of um, gender. You still see it very much in French society now um, with uh, President Macron. Uh, recently uh, stressed this again when there was an occasion, I think it was two or three months ago, when an imam, you had official residency in France, uh, quoted from the Quran uh, during a khutbah. This was reported to the authorities. The, the Quran, he was quoting a bit, uh, part of the Quran which talked about the relations between men and women. And he was reported to the authorities and he was actually expelled from France. This has actually happened uh, for teaching values contrary to the French Republic uh, and the absolute egalitarianism, as they see it, between men and women in France. And this is like taboo. If you question that in any way, uh, you, you, so you can not just, you can even be expelled from France. And this man was. And it was extraordinary seeing this imam. I forget which country he went back to. I think it might have been Morocco. Or I forget where, actually. And I saw him on YouTube. And I, I was a little bit anxious that I, we might see someone who was full of rage uh, and anger, but he wasn't. He was a man who accepted uh, what had happened to him, and he, he responded with great maturity and great wisdom to what had the clear injustice that had happened to him. Um, and Macron, uh, the French president, has reinforced this understanding, um, this very, very militant, harsh version of secularism, in my view. Um, so we, we see it manifest here in the, I think probably the 1940s, 1950s in Algeria. Um, so it comes from this, this uh, very uh, hardline secular view of men and women. Basically, the men and women are indistinguishable and are the same, and that this is to be enforced in law, in culture, even on other peoples, in the name of progress. One of these virtues of the Enlightenment, progress. So. The Enlightenment values are still there, um, but they, are, they can be in, and they are enforced uh, uh, legally and even militarily on other countries in the name of kind of freeing them. So this is the idea, you know, you know you're, you're pretty, you know, uh, expose yourself, unveil yourself, it says. Um, but within that is a very um, dark message that our secular French values will be imposed on other cultures and there's no, you know, you can't resist. That's the message. So it's very illiberal. It's not very progressive. It's quite imperialistic and colonizing, I think. Does that? Yeah. And also it applies that women who aren't pretty can stay veiled. Well, yes. <laughs> yes. 
and also the prettiness is the key point. I mean, it's quite patronising, isn't it? Uh, women, you're pretty. You know, show your prettiness. Excuse me. You know, women are not pretty. You know, women are, are many, many things. It's not just a question of prettiness. <laughs> it's it's uh, jolly. Um, yeah, it's a good point. Sorry. Yeah. Mm. I think one sensitive and a bit dangerous way that some Muslims, when they're giving dawah or trying to spread the message of Islam, they, they adopt is by showing the inconsistencies of liberalism, and that's that's something effective. Mm. Okay, but by doing this, sometimes the liberal starts to think that. In an Islamic state, liberal values are also supposed to be you know, practiced. So I remember in the first day, for instance, there was a student who asked him a question. You know, when, let's say, Muslims, they, they try to ask for the rights in a non-Muslim country, if some of the non-Muslims or the Westerners learn and study a little bit about Sharia, and they're not pleased with some of the intolerance that's over there. For example, the issue of the hijab having to be yeah. public you know, order and the public culture. What ends up happening is that um, the liberals would critique Muslims of having double standards in the sense that they're calling for freedom and their own rights in a non-Muslim country, but when non-Muslims are present in their own state, where is the freedom? Okay. So I think that when you know a Muslim preacher is look, is uh, criticizing the liberal inconsistencies, he's not doing this, trying to prove and show people that well, in in, in a Sharia-based system, everything is liberal and there's no. tolerance to no you know no limits. They're just trying to <clears throat> tell the, the liberals that you claim, you're the ones who are claiming that we are free and tolerant and liberal, and this is what, what we're seeing. We Muslims, we have limits to, we have you know, boundaries to these definitions, and we take these boundaries from our Creator. Exactly. So that has to be in the picture. If yep. we don't tell them that, um, you know, we have definitions that we get from God, and we're not claiming to be as liberal as you, then they're going to think that we also are having double standards. Yeah. Okay? So I just wanted to add this comment. No, I think it's really important. The, 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 yeah, the, the Muslim response is to always refer to the Creator uh, as, as our Lord, uh, um, rather than you know, our feelings and our views and our wishes and whims and so on, which seem to be the, the framework of the debate always. And, um, and certainly secularism is kind of weaponizing that and, uh, and then forcing that on other people. But yeah, Islam is a very radical alternative, looking at the fundamental realities of, uh, um, rather than just our own parochial issues. And that makes it very dangerous, I think. Um, because I think these words, <clears throat> you know, tolerance, liberalism, freedom, oh, yeah. they're as He has a, you know, a series of, uh, I think he was teaching people about moral justice, you know, the mm. definition of justice. There yep. are a series of a professor Muhammad talking about these things. Uh, maybe you can uh, see no, uh, yeah. he, he tells mm. people that these terms are vacuous, so mm. any culture can come up and fill them. You can fill the term yeah. neutrality with whatever you want. You can define freedom in the way that you want. And if Muslims and liberals are talking, you know, they're trying to discuss these terminologies. Mm. Nobody is going nowhere. Mm. If if we, as, as Muslim dads, let's say, people trying to call us Islam, if we just adopt that, you know, we want to be, we are also liberals, we are also free, we are also tolerant, yeah. mm. all the time, all the time, then where's Islam, you know? Yeah. Where's that in the picture? Yeah. I mean, secular values are always changing, evolving. Or de evolving and going backwards and forward, they're always changing. So you're right, they, they, they don't, they, they, these slogans of tolerance and freedom don't have any content. Um, and, and they're just the latest pressure group. And whether, whether or not next it'll be incest or pedophilia or whatever will become 
um, the new thing we've all got to accept. Um, on Tuesday, by the way, my final presentation, inshallah, I'll be talking about Islam and LGBTQ, gender, sexuality, and morality and identity. So we're going to be focusing on um, the Western tradition as it is today and as it is exporting itself globally through the media and governments and so on. And it's, uh, but looking also at the Islamic response um, to that. So we're going to focus very much on that in the final presentation. Got a whole bunch of slides um, to, to do that with. So. Yes, sir. Mm. I agree. I'd love to. Yeah, I'd love to go into more detail. I mean, I, I really, I really like Kant, for example, and Nietzsche's quite fun, even though he's a bit crazy. And uh, and Marx is, re yeah, absolutely. But I've got like sixty minutes, and uh, I, 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 I'd love to. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be giving my own opinions. So I'd probably be. The thing was to interview experts um, from those, you know, philosophers, political thinkers, and so on. Yeah, it's a really good idea. Yeah. Um, when Kant was talking about um, categorical imperatives, yeah. is he, that's his, is that his like, way of thinking about the fifth round? Because it's almost like intrinsic. No, I, I, th I think you know, he, he, he has a certain understanding of reason uh, that he believes we can deduce certain moral uh, commands and uh, non negotiables that we should. Uh, uh, all follow uh, and that we should submit ourselves to. I don't think, no, he didn't have that, I, I don't, I'm not aware of that concept existing for him. But it's a very, I think, a very austere, rule bound morality. It's called deontolo deontological ethics. So it's not consequentialist based on context and, uh, and so on. It's, it's, it's kind of uh, top down, you know, thou shalt. It's quite Old Testament -y in that sense. Um, but it's been hugely influential. But if you read his book, uh, The Groundwork of the Metaphysic and Morals, it's actually quite, quite a fascinating read. Uh, it's not at all boring. Um, and a lot easier to read than The Critic of Pure Reason, which is, as I say, the Mount Everest of philosophy books, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah, I mean, for Islamically, uh, the Islamic position is much more rich and nuanced and uh, doesn't have these kind of binary, you know, you must, or you, you must obey the rules. Uh, and I can't help thinking, maybe it's a kind of a bit anti-German, but you know, it's, it's, reading him, he feels very German. <laughs> you must obey his law, you know, I mean, okay, okay. You know. He doesn't have this kind of French kind of, you know, existentialist kind of uh, feel about it. So uh, maybe there's a bit of that as well. But uh, don't underestimate how important influential he is in the West, hugely. Because people are trying to find substitutes for revelation, I think. Um, and not very successfully, and Douglas Murray bears witness accurately, I think, to the emptiness of the heart of modern man. And Islam has, is perfectly placed, particularly Muslims now in Europe and America, to offer uh, healing and, uh, and salvation uh, through the truth. So uh, the, the Dawah opportunities are massive now, in theory. You know, it's just an open door. You know, do, do we walk through that door and offer people hope, really, I think? Yes, sorry, sister. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit confused about Nietzsche's point, you know. Yes. When he says, I, I always thought, like, his people always call him God is dead, acting like he's, like, some atheist who's very critical of everything God. But then when, when he, he says God is dead, um, and we killed him, and who's going to um, clean our hands from the blood that we Yeah, so yeah. It sounds like he's critical of the belief of what we've done to us. Like, it's, it's, yes. So am I, yes. I, I, yes. I, this is a really, really good point, sister, if I may say so. Yeah, he, he just didn't, didn't just argue that God was dead. He almost lamented that fact, in his view, uh, and, and, and saw the consequences of the absence of faith in a very clear way, quite prophetic. He died in 900, sorry, 1900, uh, beginning of the 20th century. And he, he, he uh, foresaw the rise of postmodernism and the consequences of atheism very, very clearly. He was a brilliant, brilliant thinker. But uh, he, he realized that just um, not believing in God, that it had profound consequences for our existence. So some people, for example, like George Eliot, the English writer who wrote the famous book Middlemarch, Mill on the Floss and so on, one of my favorite Victorian writers. Um, she, um, she, was, she was an atheist. 
And, but she, if you read her books, and they're worth reading, you, you know, Christian morality is still infused as everything. You know, basically the bourgeois Christian world continues. Um, but she was an atheist. But, so Nietzsche was very critical of her because she wasn't following through on her atheism, that she, she was kind of leeching off of the Christian worldview, uh, having the benefits of it without actually believing in the heart of it. So he was very critical. He said, no, 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 you've got to throw Christian morality out, out the window. It's a slave morality. It's unhealthy, he argued. And we need to go back to uh, Greek, uh, the Greek virtues, the Greek uh, way of living, which was based on heroism, and doing extraordinary things um, and elitism. He was very anti-democratic, um, very anti-socialist. <laughs> um, and you can see how that fed into national socialism in the 1930s, actually. But, um, so he was someone who took atheism really seriously and worked out the consequences of that in life. And thus spoke Zarathustra. Zarathustra is a prophet, of course, uh, in history. But he's kind of using that trope because Zarathustra wasn't an atheist, but he's using that vehicle, the prophetic vehicle, to preach atheism to a world that didn't want to hear. He's saying, a wake up world, you know, this is the truth. Um, but in my view, Nietzsche, at the heart of Nietzsche lies nihilism, that there, there is simply nothing there. And, and we know the, how that has worked out in Europe, in Douglas Murray's words, with the sense of purposeless, no meaning, and emptiness, and we look for, for trivial things like art or books to fill the gap, the God-shaped hole, as people call it, in our hearts. So um, it's not worked out, and humanity has not been ennobled by this. It's, it's gone into a very dark place, I think. And again, this is where Dawa comes in, really, I think. But you're right, it, it, it's, this is a good point, I think. It's, yes, sir? Speaking of Nietzsche, do you think that his moral nihilism was a source of I, th I think there's a big factor, yeah. I mean, I, I th don't think Nietzsche would agree that he was a nihilist. I think he was a nihilist. <laughs> um, the consequences of his thinking was nihilistic. Um, but he, he believed very much in affirming life. Nietzsche believed very much in affirming life, but in a, in a way that goes back to very ancient Greek roots. So you had the, the emphasis on the, the, the hero uh, and a contempt for compassion. He's very explicit. The compassion is bad. It's Christian. Uh, empathy, no, nah, get rid of that. Um, he, he, he doesn't side with the oppressed. He, he, he sides with the strong and the mighty and the conqueror and those who excel uh, and who, you know, these kind of, and you can see that, okay, I'm sure that Hitler might have quite liked that, yeah. Based on what do the leftist movement cite his work? If that's what yeah, not, not in that, no, yeah, no, in, in terms of his, I, that's a good question, I think in terms of his, um, his, he raises very interesting questions uh, about what it is to be a modern person, um, and in terms of postmodernism as well, he has interesting things to say about that and the role of freedom uh, and the individual in the modern world. There are other aspects to his teaching which I've not mentioned, which are very interesting to people of the left. Yeah, but his right wing, he, he's very anti-egalitarian, anti-democratic, anti-God, anti-Christian. He hates Christianity. Um, he has some good things to say about Muslims, Islamic Spain, actually. He said, uh, he, he said, because he hated Christianity, he saw it as a cult of weakness uh, a, 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 and a slave morality. And he thought, Islamically, he thought, uh, in Andalusia, which he was aware of, he said, well, this is a time in Europe when um, positive values were taught. But, I mean, this is all very controversial, and I'm not saying he's agree with what he says, but, but he's still a very influential figure today, uh, Nietzsche. But, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's strange that there are so many philosophers who are like by, I mean, like Martin, Martin Heidegger, who was um, a German philosopher of a, a design of, of uh, being in place. He's a hugely influential German philosopher. And yet he was uh, a national socialist in Germany. He joined the Nazi party. He was a Nazi. Um, but he's very influential on the left in the kind of existentialism, even today. So Nietzsche, Heidegger, it's kind of these guys are, uh, are, are still speaking to very different constituencies today. It's quite, it's quite strange. There's another guy called Carl Schmitt uh, from the 1930s as well, a political theorist who's also very popular today in uh, respected academic circles. 
and he was the head Nazi legal theorist, in, you know, the head of the, uh, the legal system in Germany in the 1930s, of all people. Um, so it's very strange what's going on. But people are, are trying to find answers anywhere, you know, the, apart from the creator, it seems. So, okay, well, I think that might be it then. Um, I think Sheikh Abdul Elia is next in a short while. So thank you very much.